This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to worship at Trinity United Methodist Church on this, our second Sunday in Advent. Um, no matter where you are in your faith, God is trying to speak something to you, and we are blessed that you are joining us today. I'm Paula Roan, the Minister of Children and Discipleship at Trinity. I want to share with you a few ways that you can stay connected with us. Um, each season, we remember that there is no greater joy than to give to others. And it's not always about the toys or the presents. Um, it's about sharing our joy and our love and family. Um, our white Christmas offering this year will be split between Embrace Florida Kids, which is the Florida portion of the United Methodist Children's Home in the Alabama West Florida Conference, and our neighbors down the street, Children in Crisis. You can donate online through the website or in person in one of our offering plates at the entrance. Um, just note White Christmas on your check. Um, and in continuing to share our joy and love this year, we are in partnership with the Emerald Coast Health Center and Rehab to bring Christmas joy to their residents. And our goal is to sponsor 70 residents for their Christmas. Um, if you are interested, please feel free to see me or to call Mackenzie Johnson at the church office tomorrow. And then the greatest gift that we have ever received is Jesus Christ. Um, and we hope that you will join us this Christmas Eve to celebrate and give thanks for God's greatest gift. We will have a 3 o'clock and a 5 o'clock traditional in-person service and a 7 o'clock um, contemporary worship um, that's in the Fellowship Hall. Traditional will be in the sanctuary. We will also be online, a traditional at 5 o'clock. Um, so space is limited in person. So we encourage you, those of you planning to attend, to um, sign up. You may call the church office. Next week we will have a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Um, uh, and then one other thing. On your way in, you should have picked up a Ziploc bag containing your communion elements. Um, I'm gonna give instruction, do not do this yet, please. Um, when Scott instructs you, you will open the Ziploc bag and you will take out the cup. Um, it's a two-fold process. There's a, um, a um, clear cellophane um, pull top at, at, on the top, and when he tells you to pull that, that contains your um, communion wafer, and then if you continue to pull, you will open the juice part. Um, then when that's done, you may put this back in the bag and on your way out, there are trash receptacles for you to drop them in. Again, no matter where you are in your faith, we're blessed that you are here with us today. I invite you now to join in a heart of worship. Um, join me in our opening prayer found printed on the screen behind me. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. God of Israel, with expectant hearts, we, your people, await Christ's coming. As once he came in humility, so now may he come in glory, that he may make all things perfect in your everlasting kingdom. For he is Lord forever and ever. Amen.
Good morning. Did that want you make tap your toes? Please do stand up and join us in our opening hymn. O come, O come, Emmanuel. promises of God are promises of hope. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. O hope of every contrite heart, O joy of all the meek, to those who fall, how kind thou art, how good to those who seek.
peace be with you all. To say that again. I'm now I'm hot, the mic is on. <laughs> Grace and peace be with you all. I'm Scott Hone, the senior pastor here at Trinity United Methodist Church, and I extend a word of welcome to all who are watching us at home also through Facebook or YouTube. The prayer book of the Bible is the book of Psalms. It's full of prayers, and we're going to read Psalm 85 responsibly together. So I'm going to ask Lisa if she'll come forward and, and give us some words of instruction. I know we don't have our hymnals in front of us, but at the back of every hymnal is what they call the Psalter. And the Psalter has responsive readings and also has musical responses. So we're going to sing a musical response today. It's the Rejoice, Rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel, just like we sang for the opening hymn. And David's going to play one time through, then we're going to sing, we'll read, and then follow the musical response cues on the um, screen. showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God will speak, for the Lord will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to the Lord in their hearts. Surely salvation is at hand for those who fear the Lord, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet, righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before the Lord, and make God's footsteps away. time of the service where we're going to lift the prayer up to God for the concerns that are in our hearts, for the joys that we're thankful for, for people that, that the Spirit has placed on our heart to remember in prayer. So I ask you, is there, are there anyone that you want us to pray for? Is there any prayer concern that you would like to lift up or joy that you want to give thanks for? Teresa. Okay, and her name is? Chris, Chris and Robin, okay. Okay, you may I ask her name or? Joy. 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 Gracie. Okay. Oh, Gracie. Yeah. We'll pray for Gracie who's having cancer treatments coming up. Thank you, Jerry. 
more like our, our kids that's hurting her and they keep in her for a while. So you have to just lift her up. Sure. We'll lift up your friend Crystal. Thank you, Kerry. Christine and Jonathan Shaver and, and their child, George, will be having surgery in Boston soon. Join with me in prayer. Savior of the nations, you give us the privilege of bringing to you our concerns, our troubles, and our hurts, as well as our joys and hopes. You provide grace for all our needs. You heal our wounds, you comfort us in our grief, you forgive our sins, and you bless our future. Hear our prayers for Chris and Robin and Gracie and Crystal and Christine and Jonathan and George. Provide them with mercy and strength so that they will experience the goodness and presence of Christ and thus be able to testify to his life-giving grace. Guide and empower us as a congregation to be and make disciples of Jesus Christ so that we will be faithful to the mission that you've given us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you are frustrated with how things are not right in this world, if you wish that things were more fair, more just, if you wish that things would change, then you could understand how the people of ancient Judea and Jerusalem felt at the time when John preached. John the baptizer preached out in the wilderness, the desert by the River Jordan. 
And so people had to travel miles and miles, had to travel days and days to go out and see John. And people would only travel that far if they were desperate. They were desperate for things to change. I've been preaching on a series called God's Gift, God's Gift to Us. Last week we talked about God's gift of God's very presence to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Today we're talking about God's gift of new beginnings, that through Jesus God really does give us new beginnings. So listen to a reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Mark writes, The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Faithful and loving God, pour your Holy Spirit upon all of us so that I will truly proclaim your gospel and that we'll have ears to apply it to our lives and the wisdom to live it. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Have you ever gotten lost and then experienced the frustration that comes with being lost? One of my earliest memories was when I was a toddler in a department store with my mother. And she was in the clothing department where they were selling coats. And so I started to play among the coats going in and out, because they were like trees. I was having a good time as a little toddler, and then I got lost. I got lost, and I still remember that fear of not knowing where my mother was. In Scripture, the, the image of getting lost often describes us turning away from God. What, what happens when we rupture our relationship with God and, and turn away? And, and so, especially in the Gospel of Luke, the 15th chapter, they use that image of being lost to describe the, the sheep that's gone astray, uh, the coin that the woman lost, the, the prodigal son, the reckless son who wasted his father's inheritance and in crazy living. These all become metaphors of someone who has made the wrong turn in life, someone who is suffering because of the wrong decisions, the consequences, and then the good news is that God goes looking for them. God goes looking for those who are lost. And God gave us Jesus Christ so we could have new beginnings. God gave us Jesus so we would have the gift of new beginnings. And that's what I want to talk about today. And I want to begin by admitting that all of us have gone wrong sometime in our life. All of us have done things wrong. And when I say that we're, we've been wrong, I don't mean to say that we're wrong in our core essence of who we really are because we're made in the image of God. We are good at, in, down deep in our heart. That's our true nature that's uncorrupted by sin. We, we are good. God does not make trash. However, we've all done things that we're ashamed of or we failed to do the things we know we ought to have done. Maybe we've lost our temper while we were driving and started cussing at another person. Maybe we passed someone who needed help, but we were too busy to stop and help them. You can all think about ways that you've fallen short of being the person that you know you ought to be. Years ago, when our son Jacob was just a toddler, I remember visiting, we were visiting my parents one summer, and, and I was hanging out with friends, I was having a good time, while my wife Elizabeth was overwhelmed with taking care of Jacob. She was the one changing his diaper, feeding him, putting him to naps. And so my parents, my mom and dad, they pulled me aside and they explained to me that I needed to step up and be a better father. 
I needed to take responsibility and also father my child. And that was a difficult conversation. I didn't want to hear that, but they were correct. They were right. I, I was wrong. Elizabeth, my wife and I, we love the TV show NCIS. You know, that's the Naval Criminal Investigation Service. It's about a sp special agent, Leroy Gibbs, and his team as, as, they, as they investigate crime. And he has a set of rules that he follows and his team follows. And, and his rule number 51 is sometimes you are wrong. Sometimes you are wrong. And I'd say that's biblical because it says in the letter to the Romans, the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin, that's when we make the wrong turn. That's when we veer off the path that we're meant to walk. And whenever we get off the path, we find ourselves in the brush and the woods and we find ourselves lost. And, and we've all gotten lost somehow. The scripture says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And when Paul tells us that, he's not trying to make us feel bad. He's not trying to lower our self-esteem. He's just acknowledging a truth of life that sometimes we're wrong. And that should not fill us with despair because we serve a God of grace, a God who came to us in Jesus Christ to forgive our sins and to give us new beginnings. And so in Jesus Christ, God really does forgive our sins, that Jesus' death on the cross, it really does wipe away our sins, that we're truly forgiven of everything we've done wrong. And, and the good thing about Jesus, is he doesn't just forgive us. I mean, he forgives us, but he does much more than forgive us. He also cleanses us of everything that's wrong within us, so we shine more and more with the light and grace of God. John the, the Baptist his job was to prepare people for the coming of the Christ. And he preached there by the River Jordan a baptism for the forgiveness of sins, a baptism of repentance, of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And then he said, someone more powerful than I is coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John understood his limits. John understood that he was not God. John understood that there was only so much he could do, but it would take God to really do that work of cleansing, that work of transformation. One is coming who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That's Mark's gospel in both Matthew and Luke. John says he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The Holy Spirit, that's one of the three persons within the very identity of God, one of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is, is represented, if you know, at Pentecost with the image of fire. We have the color red out here because the Holy Spirit is tied with fire because fire cleanses, fire purifies. A, a field that is full of brush and dead wood and, and, and vegetation that, that you want to get rid of, you, you can do a controlled burn and it'll cleanse the field so that new life will begin to grow out of it. You would use fire and heat to purify metal, to, to melt metal down so that silver and gold, precious metal, so that the dross would rise to the surface and so it could be skimmed off. See, and that, so the Holy Spirit works in our life to transform us, to cleanse us, to get us more in line with that walk of love and compassion that God calls us to embody a uh, song that I used to sing growing up that means a lot to me. It's written by a guy named Albert Orsborn, and the first verse, it says, Savior, if my feet have faltered on the pathway of the cross, if my purposes have altered or my gold been mixed with dross, oh, forbid me not thy service, keep me yet in thy employ, pass me through a sterner cleansing, if I may but give thee joy. Pass me through a sterner cleansing, that I may but give thee joy. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It passes us through a sterner cleansing so that we shine with the purity and brightness that God has already intended us to shine with. So Jesus does forgive us, but he does much more than just forgive us. He transforms us so that we become new creations, so that we have new beginnings with God. So no matter what you may have done in the past, something that you may really be ashamed of, God gives you a new beginning. God truly gives you a fresh start. 
And so what do we do in response to this good news? How do we respond to this wonderful proclamation that God gives us a new beginning, a beginning where we're really transformed and purified from all the things that guide us to be wrong so that we become new creations? What do we do? We do what John says, we repent. And, and let me explain what repentance means. There's, there's two parts of it. The first part is confession. Confession is simply when we say, I am sorry. We say, I am sorry to God in our prayers for things that we know that we've done wrong or failed to do that we should have done. We say sorry to other people when we've hurt them or harmed them. Leroy Gibbs in NCI has a, has a saying also, his rule number six is, never say, I'm sorry. And I've got to disagree with Leroy Gibbs because that's not the Christian approach. That's not a Christian viewpoint. I think the Christian viewpoint is, is what Adam Hamilton said when, about a, a marriage. The two partners in a marriage, the, you know what the most important words in a marriage are? The six most important words, according to Adam Hamilton, the six words are, I am sorry, and the other three words are, I forgive you. And I am sorry, I forgive you. If that's practiced in a relationship, then the relationship will grow and prosper. Forgiveness is, 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 is I mean, saying that repentance is much more than just saying I'm sorry. It, it, it's resolving to change. My mother told me once the story when she was helping to lead a revival, and she was part of the team that was praying for people who came forward at the end of the worship service to pray, who needed someone to pray with them. And this was a three-night revival, and my mom told me that the same woman came up each of the three nights weeping about the same sin. And she each night asked God to forgive her, but each time she would come forward and, and pray that same prayer. And so my mom took her aside and explained that, you know, God really does forgive. God really gives us new beginnings, and that we've got to be willing to change. We've got to be willing to live a different life if we're truly sincere about wanting to repent. It's more than just saying, I'm sorry. Repentance literally means turning around. So if you're driving your car in, in the wrong direction, you miss the interstate where you're supposed to get off, and you keep heading farther, farther in the wrong direction, you could feel sorry about driving in the wrong direction, but still keep going wrongly. But instead of just feeling sorry, you get off the interstate, turn your car around, and then head back in the right direction. That's what repentance is. It's living a changed life. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German pastor and theologian who, who resisted the Nazis during World War II and ended up being killed because of that, he, he started a seminary for pastors who were uh, not part of the state church in Germany, a uh, seminary in Finkenwald, and he wrote a book about how they would be living together, a book called Life Together. And in that book, he talked about the need of confession, that, that Christians can confess to one another, Christians can confess to God, he says, quote, that sin wants to be alone with people. It takes them away from community. And so as Christians, we have the courage to be authentic to one another, to be authentic about our failings so that we can hear the word of grace from one another and we can help one another go forward in the way that God is calling us to go forward. The church is not a community of people who have their act together, who have no problems, who are doing everything right, the church really is a community of sinners, broken people who need to help each other, who need the help of one another to walk forward. And that's what it means to practice authentic community, to be real with one another within the church. We help each other head in the right direction. And I think that's what groups like AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, and other 12-step programs understand, because these are communities where people are authentic with one another, but they also forgiving and gracious towards one another. And that's what we're meant to be as the church. At Christmas, we celebrate that God gives us a gift, the greatest gift of all, Jesus Christ. And through Jesus, God truly gives us new beginnings, that our lives can start afresh when we enter in relationship with God, and when we renew our relationship with God, when we've turned away from God. And the sad news is that we've all done things wrong in our life. But the good news is that God, through Jesus, forgives us and gives us new beginnings. Therefore, as a response to this, we, we repent. We, we 
confess our sins. We say, I'm sorry when we've done wrong, but then we embrace God's grace to live a transformed life, to live differently. And when we do that, we'll shine with light and we'll experience God's light in our lives as well. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now, Christ invites to his table all who earnestly desire to, to be in relationship with him, who, who want to turn away from their sins and embrace a new life. Therefore, we're given the opportunity to regularly confess our sins before God and one another. So I'm going to invite you to join with me in a prayer that's up there. This is our prayer of confession, our saying sorry to God. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law, and we have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. We're offering our gifts that are placed in the offering baskets uh, outside our doors. I'm going to say a prayer of thanksgiving for that. Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. Amen. God from whom all blessings flow, raise in all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts, praise Father, Son. your communion elements out of the Ziploc bag. It's a little wafer that's on the top and, and, and a cup of grape juice, and I'll tell you when to open them. And I'm going to invite you now to join with me in a prayer over these elements, and God will bless them wherever we are in this room. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who look for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light to the nations. You scatter the proud in the imaginations of their hearts and have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things and the rich you send empty away. Your, son, your own son came among us as a servant to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. 
By the baptism of suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Together, as God's children, we're bold to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to open the top part of the communion elements. And there's the wafer, which is the body of Christ broken for you. Okay. And I invite you to open the juice, grape juice, and this is the blood of Christ which is shed for you. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for this gift of grace, the sign of your presence with us, the sign of your faithfulness, the sign that you've given us all new beginnings and fresh starts. Lord, as we celebrated communion, we heard the Amber Alert sound, and so we pray for your grace on this situation, on this child that is lost, that you work to bring the child home. Now, Lord, equip us and enable us to continue to go out in this world to shine our light so that people will experience love, compassion, and grace through us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please stand for our closing hymn, Heralds of Christ.
what I said, the, the scripture says we've all done things wrong in our past. Again, we're not trying to make you feel bad. We're not trying to lower your self-esteem because you're made in the image of God. Who you are in your essence is, is good because you're made in the image of God. But if we're honest, we all admit that we've fallen short of who we're really meant to be. And the good news is, the good news is that God really does forgive us. God really gives us new beginnings through Jesus Christ. And God is working in us to transform us, to cleanse us of all the things that are unrighteous so that we truly shine with his love and grace and become the people that we're truly meant to be. So the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.